Welcome to the Relate Church Podcast. They call me the old guy. Because I am, yeah. <laughs> My wife likes to remind me of that. But it's interesting, we're having a child dedication, and we're talking about water baptisms. And uh, yesterday, I actually uh, had the privilege of uh, celebrating one of the greatest lives I know, which is the pastor that baptized me. And he was my, um, if you've ever watched the Jesus Revolution, he was my Chuck Smith. And it was all because of him. And you're not even here if it wasn't him. Yes. He, he would be, you know, tracked backwards where this all started. And it uh, was such a great time, such a great funeral. But it was, when I got baptized, I remember years ago, we were talking to one of my um, partners in dentistry who um, we just happened to be, you know, together on the Saturday night. And uh, the next day, uh, a bunch of Helen's relatives were coming up to Williams Lake because Ashley was a baby and Ashley was getting dedicated. And so Elmer Thiessen's his name. He says to me, so you're dedicating your baby, but you're not even baptized. <laughs> and I thought, wow, oh, you're right. So I called Pastor John and I said, I want to get baptized. And he said, sure, when? I said, tomorrow. <laughs> I know what he did. I didn't hear it, but I know what he did. He put his hand over the phone and he said, praise the Lord! Because that was John Balzer all the time. But um, it was such a great funeral, and I learned so much at the funeral. You know, the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes, it's better to go to a funeral than a party. Because you don't learn much at a party. But a life well lived, wow. And... Uh, I don't know if you know this, but we're all going to die. But what are they going to say about you? What are you going to leave behind? Everybody dies, but I don't think everybody gets celebrated like we, we got to celebrate John. What I learned from him so much was he lived this open-handed, open-door life, which he always made room for what he didn't quite understand. Like he didn't understand this crazy wild dentist who comes up to Williams Lake and plays accordion. <laughs> well, that, that, that just doesn't you know, compute. And yet he, he makes room for us. And, and like I mentioned yesterday, it was just so wild to be in a Mennonite church leading worship with an accordion on but often, I'm not playing it because my hands are raised. And uh, God just did revival. Uh, it was like, it changed my, my world, changed many other worlds as a result of it. And one of the things that John never did, because he didn't understand everything, he did, definitely didn't understand me and how weird I was, but he never judged. And I would think that is one of the, the cornerstone um, factors in every great life. Just never judge. You don't know. I don't know. And uh, I've learned so much from him because I wish I could say that about me. But I'm learning. All right. So today we're talking about Palm Sunday. What you've already heard is the celebration of when Jesus entered Jerusalem and it was the beginning of the Passion Week. So it was that Friday coming up that he hung on the cross and the Sunday coming up that he rose again. So this was the beginning of the richest portion of scripture we have. Do you know that, that over one third of the New Testament scriptures are about the final week? It's, it's amazing, Jesus, what he did. And we're going to talk about it because he did it. And often you get caught up in history. And I love history because history is his story. story. He wrote the story and we actually get to celebrate history. But today, please, just from now on, would you, would you listen to everything I say and don't, don't try to learn something about a historical moment. Take it present tense. 
because everything he did 2,000 years ago for, is for what he's doing today. We celebrate he died on the cross. And if we celebrate it in terms of what was history, it doesn't change our life at all. But he died on the cross to take our place. He looked across the years and he saw you and he saw me and he saw the mess that I was and he took my place on that cross. And that's present tense. See, everything that Jesus did was for what he's doing. And as he entered into Jerusalem, um, present tense, he needs to enter into our hearts. He needs to be welcomed as king. Not just king of the Jews. King in my heart. And when he's king in your heart, wow, makes life so, so much simpler. Now, so often, we don't understand. And a lot of people base their faith on understanding. Like, why would you do that? As if you're as smart as God is. You, you can't understand but you can trust. And when we trust him as king, then you don't have to go doubting and trying to figure everything out. Like, why did God do this? Or why didn't he do that? I don't know. He's God. I'm not. So let me read to you Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. And Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem. They came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Now, it doesn't say which two, but I think it's James and John. You know why? Because they were the sons of thunder. They were the ones that came up to Jesus and said, can, 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 or his mom did anyway. His mother came up and said, can my sons be one on your right, one on your left when you enter into the you know, kingdom? So I think, I think this whole thing was, was a, a little bit of a teaching lesson as we go on, and, and he's teaching them. It's really not about your hierarchy. But anyway, he sends two of them ahead. Go into the village over there, he said, and as soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say, the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice if you could just... <laughs> Go oh, and you just, you know, jump into my BMW and say, what are you doing? The Lord needs them. Okay. <laughs> really, it does apply to our lives today. There's a lot of things that, that the Lord needs. And he already knows where it is. He knows you. He knows what you got. He know, he, he, yes. And he actually knew this area very well. He spent a lot of time in these little towns right outside of Jerusalem. And so... I'm not sure, but I think the guy that owned the, the colt, he, he knew about Jesus. And so when they said the Lord needs it, it, it just clicked. Okay, all right. It's like, you know, I, I'm actually one of his followers. And so anyway, the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Those, those were the palm branches. That's why it's called Palm Sunday. Jesus was in the center of the procession and the people all around him were shouting, praise God for the son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this? They asked. And the crowds replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. When I was a kid, I don't know about you, but we celebrated Palm Sunday with a parade all the time. I grew up Catholic, and uh, it was the Catholic thing to do. So um, we would, uh, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd gather at Palm Sunday, and everybody had palm branches, and uh, um, there was music, and they'd be singing, and we would 
go on a parade around about, you know, four different blocks, maybe square, I, I don't know. It would take us about 20 minutes. And people would be singing Hosanna and we'd be waving branches. And I, I just thought it was cool. <laughs> really, as a kid, I was like, I'm looking forward to this. I didn't know what it meant. But it stirred a big question mark. It stirred this question mark of, of why? Who is this for? What's this about? And I think that there's a lot of people that were, were watching and they didn't know what's going on, but it stirred a big question mark. And it was good for me anyway, because it kind of set me up to, for the hunger to know Jesus, to know this reality. And we just finished talking about the Sermon on the Mount, and especially through the Beatitudes. And if you look at this procession, Jesus coming in, he kind of is the Beatitudes personified. He's kind of like, you know, on a donkey's colt, not even on the donkey, on a donkey's colt, which has, by the way, never been ridden before. As far as I know, they don't want you to ride them right away. I mean, there's, there's usually a reaction, and, and maybe that's why they had the mother along, but, 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 but if he was what the people were expecting, he wouldn't be riding in on a donkey. He'd be riding in on a stallion. He'd be coming on, the, uh, on, on a big white horse that was like, I think they measure horses by hands, several hands higher than every other horse, which is a king, conquering king, because they were all expecting him to be the Messiah. They had a, an expectation. This is what God's going to do. He is going to come and he's going to be the Messiah, which will be the warrior king that will deliver us from political power, the Romans right now. And a lot of people have a lot of expectations of what God should do. The question I have is, what, what do you do when God doesn't do what you want him to do? What do you do when God doesn't behave the way you think he should behave? What do you do when God doesn't heal that person that you thought he should heal? And this is really, I was actually thinking that would be the whole message. I'll just talk about what do you do when, when God doesn't do what you want him to do. But there's other things I want to bring out. But, but the people in that day, they were expecting the Messiah on a horse. And he comes in on a donkey. On a donkey's colt. Which actually re reflects what, what um, Solomon went through and reflects what would happen if a king was coming in with the message of peace. And Jesus wanted to know that he was coming in with a message of peace. And everything we talked about in the, in the Beatitudes is really what he was living up to. He was demonstrating those kingdom values. He wasn't coming in high and mighty. He was coming in meek. Actually, brokenhearted. I'll get to that. He was coming in mourning, looking forward and hurting. It wasn't, it wasn't this, this, people think, you know, it's just the great triumphal entry where, where everybody is excited. And they were. But he knew what he was doing. It wasn't coming in to be the conquering king. He was coming in to give his life. This is the one reason Jesus came to earth, to die. It wasn't even, he was really good at healing everybody and he was really good at, at setting people free and he was really good at, at, at preaching messages, but that's not the number one thing he came for. The number one thing he came to do, right there. And he was making that statement as he came in. And as we went through the Beatitudes, it truly was the upside down world, the counterculture world that he was showing us. And I want you to also understand this. No one, including John the Baptist, his cousin, understood what he was doing. Nobody understood what he was doing. Everybody had an expectation, but, but they were all wrong. 
What do you do when, when, when Jesus doesn't do what you want him to do? Just because everyone else wanted him to do something doesn't change him. He, he, he knew who he was and what he was doing. And he came for a purpose. And the, the neat thing about this, if you read this, and you read it through all four Gospels, it's very rare that you see everything, you know, some story that's in all four of them. This one is. And you, one thing you've got to recognize is he actually orchestrated the whole thing. It wasn't like all of a sudden he came in and they praised him. Oh, what? no, no, no. No, he, he wasn't modest about it at all. He came in knowing that they were going to recognize and think and say, and you know, he, he'll go get the donkey. And when, when you go get it, tell him that the master wants it. And what's going to happen when he tells them that is everybody is going to spread the word. Back in those days, they didn't have um, Facebook and <laughs> all the stuff we have. But they had word, word of mouth went really, really well. And so when this area where actually Lazarus was raised from the dead, not too long before this, they were all so excited about Jesus. When they heard Jesus, the master has need of it. There was already a crowd. He didn't just orchestrate for the, for the donkey. I think he orchestrated for a crowd. He knew what was going to happen. He orchestrated that they should actually recognize. This was to what I'm calling this message is the great reveal. He was revealing. And I pray for every single one of us in the room. It's a great reveal that's going to change your eternity. When he asked Peter, remember, he said, Peter, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you're the, the, the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, you didn't get this from your textbooks. You didn't get this from figuring it all out. You didn't get this from man. You got this from my father in heaven. This is a revelation. I don't think there's any other way to get to the place where Jesus is king in your heart other than by revelation. It's the great reveal. He's coming in and he's revealing who he really is. And the first thing he reveals is he's the Passover lamb. He came as the Passover lamb. Actually, they were, they were getting ready to celebrate the Passover. And people were coming into Jerusalem. Some say that the city um, it exploded in population three or four times its normal. I think it's kind of like... Have you been one of those people that went down to the fireworks member years ago? They had the fireworks down here? 500,000 people down at English Bay, and you're, you're, you're in the crowd. I think it was like that. It was a crowd. There was a crowd of people that came for the Passover. And the Passover was the celebration that God told the, the, the Jewish people to continue to celebrate because it looked back again on history when God delivered them out of Egypt. When God said, let my people go. And when Pharaoh said, no, 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 10 times on the 10th time, he said, if you say no this time, then the firstborn of every household is going to die. And he told the, 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 the children of Israel to take the blood of the lamb that they were to sacrifice, which was called the Passover lamb, and put the blood on the doorposts and on the, the, the gate, and, and, and God will pass over or the, the, the angel of death would pass over that house. And they didn't realize it, but, but all of that was foreseeing, foreseeing Jesus. He was the real Passover lamb. So he came in during that Passover time and let people know who he was. It was this crowded celebration time in Jerusalem. And he was letting people know. Now John the Baptist, his cousin, was the one who actually put the word out that, that then they began to, to understand. I don't think they understood it until afterwards. But they looked back and they would. And it was John chapter 1 where, in verse 29, where John the Baptist, he's baptizing in the River Jordan and here, here comes Jesus. And when he sees Jesus, he says, the next day John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin 
of the world. He was and is our Passover lamb. God passes over judgment of you and I because we're forgiven because Jesus took our sin on that cross. It was going to happen just a few days from that time. So he entered as a Passover lamb. Second thing, he revealed himself as the Messiah. And he entered into Jerusalem as the Messiah. And he needs to enter into our heart as the Messiah. The Messiah, like I said, most people was thinking he was the warrior. But Jesus was actually fulfilling the prophecy that told people he was the Messiah. The prophecy is in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. We already read it, where it says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey riding on a donkey's colt. So those, are, those are, are scriptures that are prophetic about the Messiah. And it was clear by the way he came in. He wasn't, and he never, he never argued. He was, thought he was the Messiah. He, he, it was the great reveal. He said, yes, he is. When the religious leaders confronted Jesus, this is interesting, because the children and all the crowd and everything were, were shouting Hosanna. And they were calling him, claiming he was the Messiah. And so they confronted Jesus in Luke 19. Let me read it to you, verse 37 to 40. The followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. He replied, listen, if they keep quiet, the stones along the road would burst into tears. Now, you have to think about if the stones are going to sing, what are they singing? Can't get no. I should never have heard that. <laughs> Some of you don't even get it. <laughs> it's so bad. I told myself I wouldn't do that. I did it anyway. Chris, the stones. Yes. You got it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Their shouts of Hosanna, which means, Lord, save us now. Actually, their shouts were about political freedom. But Jesus was coming for something far more important than political freedom. He was coming for spiritual freedom. He's coming to set us free from the sins in our life and from what, what would condemn us to a lifetime without him. So he was the Messiah, and he is the Messiah. But number three, the one that I think is so important is he came to be the king of our heart. He came to be the king of our heart. We call this triumphal entry of his into the city of David a historical account. But I believe God wants us to see it present tense. It's a triumphal entry into our hearts. His purpose has always been to be the king of our hearts. I believe Jesus looked across the years, saw our mess, and wept. That's what I, I think when we talk about the Beatitudes, blessed are those who mourn. He was mourning. Listen to this story. I'm going to read it to you. Listen really hard, okay? This is so important. Luke chapter 19, verse 41. But as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. You know the word weep there? There's only two times in the Bible where it talks about Jesus wept. Everybody know the other one? Lazarus' tomb. But the word used in Lazarus' tomb talks about a few tears. This one talks about mourning and wailing. He was hurrying. He was on his way in on this donkey. 
they were all yelling Hosanna, putting their garments down and palm branches down. And he looked at the city and he began to weep. How I wish today that you, of all people, would understand the way to peace. But now it's too late. And peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. Okay, this is historical. And Jesus is weeping, and, and it's because historically he sees what's going to happen. Prophetically, 70 years, not, well, at 70 AD, Jerusalem is conquered by Rome, and not one stone is left on top of another. It's totally destroyed. So he's looking and he's weeping about what's going to happen because. And the big thing is because. Because what? Well, he says it in the last line. It says, because you did not recognize it when God visited you. You didn't recognize who he really was. You didn't recognize his, that he came to be the king of your heart. You thought he came to be the king politically. You were wrong. And because you were wrong, this is what, what is the result of it. And I think today he looks across the years and he sees so many of us and the mess that either we're in or is coming. And it's the same because. Because you didn't recognize who he is. Because you didn't actually receive him as the king of your heart. A lot of people think, you know, well, Jesus was just a really, really good person. He, and he was. He's a great teacher. And he was. He's a great religious leader. And he was. But if you don't get who he is, you don't get anything. From what Jesus did and what we're looking at, there's only two reactions. Crown him or crucify him. Crown him as king of your heart or get rid of him. There's no in between. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He says, you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. Because we don't recognize. I don't know if, if you can apply this to your life or you know of other people in your world where they tried to keep Jesus as a nice teacher. But as soon as you take him out of the throne in your heart, you're on a pathway. And I think Jesus looks across the years and weeps, wails, hurts, mourns for the pathway that has a result. And so this great triumphal Palm Sunday is only triumphant if, if he's entering into your heart, if he's your king. And if he's your king, it makes life so easy. I've listened to a lot of people over the years that say, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in God. And so I just ask them why. And almost always they'll trace back to, well, if there was a God, if he's real, then he wouldn't let this happen. Yeah. Or he wouldn't have done that. Yeah. Yeah. Right? 
the thing about it, if, if you step into a place where you're God, then you figure it all out. And if God doesn't actually line up with what you figured out, then I, I, I just can't agree with him. But the fact is, you're not God. And we will never be. And you being a Christian has nothing to do with you understanding everything he's done. It has everything to, to just recognize he's king. And he's, if he's king of your heart, then whatever he decides, whatever happens, you just thank God. God's involved somehow. God's going to work all things out for good. I don't have to understand how. I don't have to have it all figured out. I think the great reveal on Palm Sunday is that he's king of kings and lord of lords in my heart. You know, the crowd was composed of three things. Followers, bystanders, and enemies. None of them understood what he was doing. His disciples were there and they didn't understand what he was doing. So if you don't understand everything God is doing, join the human race. You don't have to understand it all. When he's king of kings and lord of lords, you just know that he'll never stop loving you. He'll never leave you. Never. Do you know everyone else will? Everyone else will. There's a day for every one of us coming where we will stand alone. And there's only one that needs to be there and you need to have in your heart, and that's Jesus. When you stand before him, he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. That's being king of your heart. How we respond to what God doesn't do when we thought he would do really says a lot about who's king in your heart. If God just continues to do what you told him to do, <laughs> then I still don't know where you stand. But you probably have had those opportunities when God doesn't do what you thought he should do. Anybody? That's when you find out who's king of kings, lord of lords. Because he's king of my heart. And I know, no matter what happens, that'll never change. Everything else is subject to change. Life's short. It's like a vapor. Eternity's long. Hell's terrible. Heaven's wonderful. Everyone leaves. Not Jesus. Hosanna. Desperate. God save now. I need you. You know, these this I've been studying this for a while now. And I must tell you it's challenged me big time. Because the hunger and the desperation can never leave. If you think you've figured out whatever and you've got to a certain place, you're wrong. I want to until the day I take my last breath. I want to be so desperate for him. Be the king of my heart. I don't understand everything. And help me to understand more. But come in. Let me close with one, one little thing. You know, if you go back to the beginning, when Adam messed up. Because Adam messed up. Adam and Eve messed up, right? And just like you and I, we all mess up. God looks across the years and he weeps for the result. And because of the result of Adam... That's what happened, the cross. But I think about after Adam messed up, God came looking for him. 
Do you remember the story? Genesis chapter 3? God's walking in the garden and said, Adam, where are you? Where are you? When I read that, I, I couldn't help but think of Helen. How many times? John, where are you? And I'm not hiding in the closet. I'm right there in front of her. And I get upset and say, I'm right here. No, 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 no. I, I know physically you're right there, but where are you? I think God's saying that to so many of us. Where are you? And then you know what the next thing she says will be? Let me in. I think that's what God's saying. Where are you? Let me in. And when you let him in, he's, he's Lord of all. Or not Lord at all. He's king. He's not coming in as a, as a good teacher. Just a nice guy. Let me in. Let me close in prayer. Can you just bow your heads with me? Close your eyes and I'm not. I'm just going to pray for you. After the service is over, we opportunity to respond. There's going to be pastors up front. And I believe there's a number in the room, so many of us, that you'd have to answer and say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hiding right now. You know, I've kind of messed up and, and I'm hiding right now. But Jesus is saying, just let me in. Let him be the king in your heart. It's the greatest life you'll ever live. I think of my hero, John Balzer, yesterday at the funeral. He just lived such a rich life. Had nothing to do with finances and stuff. It had everything to do with just living a life of purpose and making a difference. And that's what God has for every one of us. But it starts with Jesus. Be the Lord of my life. If you've never made that choice, you've never opened your heart, you hear him say, just let me in. I want to pray a simple prayer with you, for you. I just encourage you to pray this prayer. Open your heart to him. Let him be the king in your heart. So no matter where you're at in the room, if you've never prayed a prayer like this, I'm just going to encourage you to pray. I'm going to ask everyone, if you have prayed it a million times, pray it again right now. Can we say this together out loud? If you've never prayed it, pray it loud enough for your ears to hear your voice. And just mean it. Watch God. Everyone say this, Lord Jesus. I believe in you. You love me so much. You took my place. Paid for my sins died on that cross so that I could be free. You rose again and I believe you're alive right now. I open my heart. I invite you. Be the king of my heart. I receive you. Amen. Father, thank you for everyone that prayed that prayer. Those that prayed it maybe first time or get get right with you again. I just thank you, God, as we leave this place. We look forward to what you have for us because you said you never leave us or forsake us. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. If something stood out to you, if you'd like to submit a prayer request, or if you'd like to learn more about how you can get connected, email relate at relatechurch.ca. If you'd like to partner with us and our community initiatives, please visit relatechurch.ca slash give. It's been an honor to spend this time with you. Catch you next week.